Iran has the largest and most capable ballistic missile arsenal in the Middle East. The Islamic Republic is the first country to develop a 2,000 km range missile before developing a nuclear weapon, giving them the ability to accurately strike anywhere in the Middle East, including Israel and Eastern Europe. According to their own Ministry of Defense, Iran ranks sixth in the world for missile production, even though Iran has been sanctioned by the UN for decades with the aim of crippling the country's economy and military industrial capacity instead of a nation impoverished to the point where it can barely afford a military, Iran has a well-trained and equipped missile force with precision-guided munitions. To put all of this into context, in 1998, Iran's best ballistic missile, the newly tested Shahab-3, had half the range of today at 1,000 kilometers. So how does Iran continue to not only produce more missiles, but add new models with ever more advanced capabilities each year? When will the nation have intercontinental ballistic missile capabilities? And is there anything the United States can do to counter this new reality? My dad does something very unconventional when it comes to his wallet needs. He has a giant fishing vest that has a ton of little pockets that are too small to fit his leather wallet that's stuffed with receipts. So what he does, instead of using a wallet, is he takes all of his credit cards and he stuffs them into the little pockets on his fishing jacket. So what I suggested was, hey dad, maybe why don't you use a Ridge wallet? It's slim enough to actually fit into those tiny pockets on your jacket. Here, he's calling me right now. I was wondering, did, did the Ridge wallet work for you in your fishing jacket? Oh, I use it all the time, yeah. You, you see the pocket I put it in. So I had everything, you know, just thrown in there. Now, it's nice and neat and tight. Ridge has 3 million customers and over 80,000 five-star reviews. So head over to ridge.com slash task and purpose to take advantage of Black Friday deals up to 30% off through December 20th. And if you use my link, you can enter your email or SMS to get a free chance to win a Ridge bundle worth up to $4,000 without having to purchase a thing. The Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps Aerospace Force is the strategic missile force inside of Iran. The International Institute of Strategic Studies estimates that they have about 15,000 soldiers dedicated to their missile operations today. To give you an idea of just how the missile program is viewed inside Iran, take a look at this public billboard on display in the country written in Persian, Arabic, and Hebrew. It shows their new hypersonic missile, and it says 400 seconds to Tel Aviv inside Israel. They were founded in 1985, but this unit traces its roots back even further when Iran was reorganizing the country and its military after the Iranian Revolution of 1979. At this point, they had the largest air force in the Gulf with over 400 combat aircraft, many of which were ironically provided by the United States themselves. The problem was, Iran's ability to maintain these systems was fast declining at the time because they had just broken ties with the West and would now have limited access to new parts and advanced weapons. It was at this point in 1980 that Iraq launched an invasion to take advantage of Iran's perceived vulnerability. Iraq chose to target major Iranian urban areas with Scud ballistic missiles. Iran retaliated in kind with Scud missiles of their own in an exchange that's known as the War of the Cities. These major missile exchanges lasted the entire course of the war, all the way into 1988, prompting Iran to develop missiles of their own to try to beat Iraq at the missile game. But these early Scuds and Iranian missiles were extremely inaccurate, between 300 meters and 3 kilometers of the target point, depending on the version. But they had longer range than conventional rocket artillery. Considering this was literally called the War of the Cities, even accuracy that bad is good enough if your target is as big as that city over there. Iran got a head start on their missile development by adopting foreign supplied rockets and building their own versions in-house. The Soviet Union wasn't very interested in supporting Iran during its war with Iraq. This is because the Soviet Union saw the extremist Islamic theocracy from their point of view as a threat to global communism. But the People's Republic of China and North Korea were more than willing to play ball with Tehran. This is why many of Iran's early missiles are based on Chinese or North Korean rockets, and the practice of adapting East Asian missiles into current Iranian-produced versions continues all the way to today. Iran further modified the original ground-launched Chinese Type 83 design to allow it to be fired from their Iranian F-4 Phantoms and F-14 Tomcats provided by the US. China is widely believed to have helped Iran construct the Saman missile complex where Iran develops, tests, and builds many of its ballistic missiles. 
China and North Korea saw a kindred spirit in Iran. All three nations were shunned on the world stage to some degree, especially after China's Tiananmen Square crackdown in 1989. And so supporting Iran allowed both East Asian countries the chance to secure some much needed influence on the global stage. Iran badly needed allies as well, and the bloody war with their neighbor Iraq reinforced the lesson that they needed a strong deterrent against future aggression. Ballistic missiles are particularly attractive to developing militaries like Iran, because they're a cheap form of force projection, or at least cheaper than a large air force or navy would be. They allow a country to threaten to strike far from their borders without much required training, and it's hard for defenders to stop. And as the country's technology and military industrial level increases over time, their missiles naturally evolve in range, accuracy, and payload along with it. For example, the first missiles Iran produced, like the Aghab, only had a range of about 30 kilometers. But by 1987, Iran was producing its own version of the Soviet Scud B called the Shahab-1. With a range of 300 kilometers, Iran would fire the Shahab-1 into Iraq several times in the 1990s, targeting rebel groups that routinely conducted cross-border raids into Iran. Shahabs is Persian for meteors, and they have long been at the core of Iran's missile program. They use liquid fuel for energy, and it involves a time-consuming launch process, so that's one weakness of the Shahab. It takes a long time to set up fuel and launch, which then makes them vulnerable to airstrikes. In the 1990s, they developed the improved Shahab-2 missile with a range of 500 kilometers or 300 miles. Iran is believed to have around 300 of these two missile types in their arsenal today. Iran wouldn't fire any missiles in anger during the early 2000s, at least not directly, but they continued to research and develop more reliable missiles with better range and accuracy. This includes their anti-ship guided missiles like the Kalsar series. In the 2006 war in Lebanon, Hezbollah heavily damaged two Israeli warships 10 miles off the coast and killed four Israeli crewmen using these missiles. Iran was truly becoming the one-stop shop for all your militant group missile needs. This is the Shahab-3. It was first tested in 1998 and put into service in 2003, based on North Korean technology. Its warhead weighs about 2,200 pounds, giving it about the same size payload as one of America's JDAM precision-guided airstrike missiles. This modification gave it a range of 1,600 kilometers, which means it qualifies as a medium-range missile. This puts NATO members Turkey, Greece, Bulgaria, and Romania within striking range if it was fired from Western Iran. The focus of this capability at the expense of everything else makes sense from Iran's perspective. Iran, China, and the rest of the world realized after watching the wars in Iraq in 1990 and then again in 2003, the lesson was clear for them. If you allow the United States military to mass large quantities of soldiers in a nation right outside your border, it's probably not going to end well for you. From their strategic point of view, massive stockpiles of long-range missiles are necessary to force the United States military to spread their forces out and decentralize, making them weaker, which is exactly what the U.S. has had to do when adjusting in the region now. This key concept is known as Anti-Access Area Denial, or A2AD, and the U.S. military considers that the enemy's adoption of these kinds of anti-access area denial strategies may well be the most difficult operational challenge U.S. forces will have to face over the coming decades. The arsenal has already been used in January of 2020 against U.S. forces when they were attacked by Iran's ballistic missiles. 100 U.S. troops were injured inside Iraq from 22 retaliatory strikes after the assassination of Iranian Revolutionary Guard General Qassam Soleimani. Through its proxies, Iran received combat reports on how their weapons were performing in the field, funneling that data back to their R&D programs to develop new types of missiles for both conventional and asymmetric warfare. This is a key term referred to as battle damage assessment in the military. In 2008, Iran unveiled its Sejil-2 staged solid propellant missile. This has a re-entry speed of more than five times the speed of sound, making it difficult to target to intercept with air defense systems. Sejil missiles are unique because they're the first ones not based on prior North Korean technology and present more of a challenge to Iran's potential enemies. This is because solid fuel missiles can be launched from a mobile launcher and with less notice than the Shahab liquid fueled missiles. That means they're tough for the U.S. forces to target and strike prior to launch. It's said to have a range of 2,000 kilometers. Its sixth test flight landed in the Indian Ocean over 1,900 kilometers away. By 2010, Iran's president's first budget request that was submitted to parliament 
called for over $400 million dedicated to their ballistic missile projects. In 2013, Iran ratified their aerospace roadmap that called for missile development to deter their enemies. According to this publication from the United States Defense Intelligence Agency, Iran's missile force, the Al Ghadir Missile Command, falls under the control of the IRGC Aerospace Force and serves as a key tool of Iranian power projection. The AGMC periodically conducts highly publicized national level exercises demonstrating the capabilities and readiness of the force. These show of force type events typically include publicized missile launches and statements highlighting Iran's missile capabilities and deterrent posture. General Kenneth F. McKenzie Jr., the former head of U.S. Central Command, said this to the Senate Armed Services Committee just last year. Iran has over 3,000 ballistic missiles of various types, some of which can reach Tel Aviv in Israel. Over the last five to seven years, they've invested heavily in the ballistic missile program. Their missiles have significantly greater range and significantly enhanced accuracy. So in 2017 and 2018, Iran really started showing off its shiny new arsenal of advanced, long-range missiles. It fired 12 Zulfagar ballistic missiles at ISIS targets 700 kilometers away in eastern Syria, and seven new guided versions of the Fateh-110 ballistic missiles at Kurdish forces in northern Iraq. Iran has also developed their own cruise missiles by now, and defense analysts believe a derivative of the Iranian Sumar cruise missile was used in the 2019 attack on the Armco oil refinery complex in Saudi Arabia. For the 2020 attack on the U.S. airbase in Iraq, Iran used its new Qayyam-1 ballistic missile to strike with seriously impressive accuracy against point targets within the bases, so they achieved a CEP of less than 10 meters. CEP stands for Circular Error Probable. Basically, fancy missile speak for the circle where 80% of hits land, so the smaller it is, the more accurate the missile. Iran was proving it had mastered missile and guidance technology, boasting it had developed medium-range ballistic missiles that could reach southern Europe if it needed. But the main target in its crosshairs would always be the elimination of Israel. But Iran has been under a whole series of sanctions for years. While mainly targeting Iran's nuclear program, the sanctions have also aimed to severely restrict Iran's economy and prevent the kind of military-industrial development that would allow for advanced guidance systems, new rocket fuels, and heavy engines that are required for the types of missiles that Iran is developing. The U.S. first levied sanctions against Iran in 1979 as a result of the Iranian Revolution that ousted the U.S.-friendly government. But other countries and the United Nations have added to the growing list of embargoes against the country over the years as a result of Iran's backing of international terror groups and a contribution to global arms proliferation. Along with significant restrictions on Iran's financial and banking systems, these various sanctions packages also target Iran's oil exports, trade of consumer and electronic goods, and Iranian shipping and transport industries. Cut off from most international markets, Iran's economy has suffered tremendously. The Iranian economy has had numerous recessions since 2000, with inflation reaching as much as 40% at its peak in 2014, and unemployment around 20%. A 2015 U.S. Treasury report estimated restrictions on oil exports had cost Iran $140 billion worth of lost oil revenue, and the country's economy was 15-20% to 20 smaller than it would have been as a result of the latest tightening of sanctions that hit in 2012. Over $100 billion worth of financial assets are frozen in foreign countries and are major leverage for the United States and the European Union when trying to bring Iran to the negotiating table about their missile program. While Iran has suffered deep wounds to its economy, the sanctions haven't affected its military and missile programs as much as intended. For one, Iran has adapted to living with sanctions and going without many modern amenities. The government and its police forces have also gone a long way in motivating people to not complain about a lack of iPhones and burger joints. Secondly, Iran has invented clever ways to evade sanctions by exploiting third-party countries and black markets. Iran has established shadowy banking networks in the UAE and Hong Kong, where local governments are less likely to cooperate with Western authorities like the United States. The United States sanctioned 39 companies in March of 2023 for helping Iran get around the financial and banking restrictions that are supposed to keep its cash flow in the red. Many of Iran's industries are state-run and established shell companies abroad to hide their true ownership. 
meaning that every barrel of oil it's able to sell and every gold bar it's able to transfer are funneled directly into Iran's government coffers. It also means Iran's state-run defense industries can't say no to a contract, even if it would be unprofitable in a more market-driven economy. This complex network of front companies and false registrations is also one of the main reasons Iran is able to get its hands on specialty items it needs for its missile programs. As just one example, a Chinese businessman was criminally charged by a New York court in 2009 for his role in a vast international conspiracy of covert transactions that allowed Iran's state-owned defense industry organization to source tungsten and high-strength steel alloys needed for missile and aerospace applications. Western intelligence agencies believe that Iran used similar methods to obtain the microelectronics and sensors that they need for their latest missiles and drones. Dual-use technology like telecommunications, navigation devices, engines, and microchips are banned under UN, US, and EU sanctions, yet they keep turning up in Iranian weapons. In an examination of Iranian drones deployed against Ukraine, the agency Conflict Armament Research found over 500 components from 70 non-Iranian companies, 80% were from US companies and recently manufactured as fresh as 2020 or 2021, proving that Iran is still able to source banned components through its illicit supply chain. Iran has even set up a space program for launching satellites, Although the West widely believes it's just being used as a front for testing new rocket designs and new ways of integrating electronic components into its missiles. This isn't to say international sanctions haven't had effects on Iran's military though, and every missile produced is a major investment for the country. Israel, the primary target of Iran's revolutionary rhetoric, regularly attacks Iran's defense industry and military leaders with drone strikes and special operations by Mossad, which is the Israeli intelligence agency. Iran is also worried about the US air and missile strikes against its production facilities in the event of an all-out war with America. So the country has developed underground and camouflaged factories to produce and store its missiles until needed. In a video posted by the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, they call one of these facilities its quote-unquote missile city, showing hundreds of missiles and control systems in tunnels and remote staging grounds near the Gulf Coast. Iran has exported the knowledge of how to build these underground factories and storehouses to its proxies as well. The Washington Policy Institute writes, one new capability demonstrated since 2020 is an automated missile launch system that can position up to five fully fueled ballistic missiles on an underground rail car for sequential ripple fire launch through a single vertical shaft. 2023 has been a big year for Iranian missiles. They introduced the country's first hypersonic missile, a new carrier killer, it's an anti-ship cruise missile. While not a true hypersonic glide vehicle, the Fatah hypersonic missile is claimed to use a thrust vectoring solid fuel second stage to help it maneuver in the upper atmosphere, making it more survivable against missile defense systems like Patriot and Iron Dome and Thad and the Arrow. Most ballistic missiles follow very predictable trajectories that are much easier to intercept. But the Fatah's claim to Mach 12 maneuverability and a 1,200 kilometer range are a serious jump in Iran's capabilities. See, Iran states that this 2,000 kilometer range is a self-imposed range limit. Intercontinental ballistic missiles are classified as having 5,500 kilometers or more distance, and today Iran is estimated to be working on a three-stage, over 3,000 kilometer missile, which means they're still likely a decade or so away from being able to reach the United States with any kind of intercontinental ballistic missile. Their space program is what would allow them to strike the homeland of the United States. Meanwhile though, Iran claims their space program is merely peaceful. This represents the country's most recent developments, but they're unlikely to have many of these hypersonic missiles in service. The majority of Iran's missiles will still be older types with lower ranges and poorer accuracy but it's still important to not underestimate their effects. For instance, a 2015 study by the RAND Corporation concluded that a major US air base could be shut down for at least eight days by just 50 ballistic missiles if they have moderate accuracy. And highly accurate versions would likely need even less hits to achieve the same effect. Even without nuclear weapons, Iran's conventional missile forces are a major threat to Israel and other regional enemies that even Europe might have to contend with. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. Follow me for updates on this topic at Cappy Army on Instagram. Check out one of our videos while you're here, and I'll see you again soon.